Hi everyone, I'm Holly Gainsborough, and I am truly honored to be a part of the Lupus Education Summit this year, and I thank you, Jenny Prince, for bringing me on, and I thank all of you for participating. So a little bit about myself. I'm a grief educator, I'm a grief support practitioner, I'm a certified grief recovery specialist, as well as a Reiki Mastery Mindfulness practitioner. So the umbrella under which I work really encompasses a lot um, of various things for the grief community. Uh, I myself got into grief work uh, after experiencing my own loss many years ago, 10 and a half years ago. So I come from this with a deep understanding as well as you know extensive training. So I wanna go over a couple of definitions about grief. Grief is the normal and natural reaction to a loss. I'm gonna repeat that. Grief is the normal and natural reaction to a loss. Sometimes grievers are not received well, right? And we wonder, are we normal, like what is wrong with us? And there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with whatever you are feeling or experiencing during whatever loss you are experiencing. Another definition used by the Grief Recovery Institute is grief is the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. Grief is the conflicting feelings caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. So I repeat that one and emphasize that one because for those of you who have been diagnosed with lupus, and those of you who are caregivers to a level with lupus or perhaps other illnesses and other losses, clearly there's been a change. There's been a change in a familiar pattern of behavior. Any diagnosis is an end of what was and a change in what is. So that familiar pattern of behavior is, whether it's your own illness or somebody else's, so that's a really important piece and I want you to sort of just digest that for a moment. I want to go over a different grief, different losses. There were so there were over 40 losses out there. We won't experience all of them, <laughs> but we will experience some. And as you know, and you have, um, loss is not just death. Loss is a change in health, being diagnosed with an illness, whether it's a terminal illness, whether it's just an acute illness, whatever that is. Loss is also empty nesting, moving, job change, job loss, aging, menopause, children getting married, having children. There are varied losses. So think about for just a moment some of the other experiences you have had and thought to yourself, I didn't know that was a loss. You know, I wondered why I was feeling kind of sad and couldn't figure out why when this happened, why I was feeling sad when my, if you have children, went off to college, or why I felt sad when my parents moved us when we were little, or when I sold our, my house and moved to a different house or to, to a different apartment. You know, there are so many and we have not learned as a society what grief is and how to grieve and how to allow others to grieve. It has become quite a problem, right? We've learned how to count, we've learned math, we've learned reading, we've learned, you know, my generation, we've learned home economics, we've learned all sorts of things, but the one thing nobody's taught us is how to grieve. And so this is what we're gonna talk about today. So for those of you diagnosed with lupus, right, you've had this dramatic change, change in a familiar pattern of behavior. And it is not unusual to experience some grief in that. And what is the grief? What is it that brings about the grief? Well, your dreams, hopes, and expectations of what your life looked like, or what your life was going to look like, what the future looked like, what the moment in time looked like. And when we experience that, and when we let ourselves feel it and recognize it, we can move through it. You don't get over it, right? Grief is not something you get over. You hear people say, oh, just get over it. You know, when people say things that are, well, well-intentioned usually, sometimes they're not very helpful, right? 
So if you were diagnosed or you're a caregiver of someone with lupus, there are many things. I want you to think about this for a minute. What did people say? What did people say to you that was less than helpful, less than useful to you? It kind of ticked you off a little bit. Um, normally, so normally my workshops are interactive, so you these are raising your hand and saying, oh, they said this, they said this, they said this, but I'm going to sort of interject, but I'm going to give you a moment. Just take a moment and think about it. You can even write some things down if you want to make some notes for yourself of some things to remind yourself. And it's not to dwell in that place, but to give yourselves permission to recognize that it felt bad. Because sometimes when grievers feel bad, when somebody says something and it feels bad, we internalize it or we start questioning ourselves, right? There's that, well, maybe they're right. Or I shouldn't be mad at them. Oh, but they meant well. They were being loving. They came from their heart. And yes, all those things are true. People are usually well-intentioned. People are coming from their heart. And people are uncomfortable. So sometimes people just say stuff without thinking. And it's okay for you to be upset about it. It's okay to not feel good about what they said to you. And it's okay to still love them and to accept who they are. But it's really okay. And I want you to give yourselves permission in this moment and every moment thereafter to recognize that if something doesn't feel good, it's okay to embrace yourself and nurture yourself through that. So some things that someone might say to you, well, well, it could be worse. You could have blah, 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 whatever that is. It could be worse. You're still here. It could be worse, right? That could be worse is a huge piece. And for caregivers, it's a little, well, you still have your loved one. Aren't you lucky? Yes, of course you are. Like, duh, yeah. But it's still hard, right? It's still hard. A lot of times people will say things like, well, you know, you just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Or they'll ask really silly questions like, so what's the prognosis? You know, what are, the doc what, what are they going to do? Well, that's not helpful either, right? Because you don't know. Right? You don't have us know what a prognosis is really truly going to be. You know statistically about certain things about diseases. But those are not useful and helpful things to say. So anybody who's watching that is a lupus patient, a lupus caregiver, or just a friend who's not sure of what to say or do, here's the what not to do. Those are some of the things that can be sometimes hurtful unintentionally. What is helpful? I'm here. How are you today? How are you in this moment? I am with you. I support you. Here's what we don't want to do to the patient or the, or the caregiver, to the griever. Let me know if you need anything. Call me. What can I do? Because here's what happened when people ask those questions, and you, you all know this. It places the burden on you. It places the burden on you. Now, not only are you either caring for a loved one with lupus, or you are someone with lupus, working towards your own health and staying present in your health and caring for yourself and for others. Now, you've got a whole group of people that you're like, now they want to know what they can do, and it adds the burden onto you. Like, I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. Or I know what I need, but I don't feel like telling you what I need. Figure it out. I can't take on one more task, right? So, so this part of the program is just to sort of validate where you are or your experiences. Because we don't get that a lot. We don't get a lot of validation. Um, we get a lot of patting on the head. We get a lot of head tilts. Mm, sorry, are you okay? Not helpful. Kind, meaningful, you know, well-intentioned, but not helpful in the moment. So let's just take a moment, take a breath, as digesting what I'm saying in the past 10 minutes. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit more about grief. I want to talk about the myths. So there are some myths about grief. So, and this can happen for the diagnosed, this can happen for the caregiver, and this can happen for somebody who has lost a loved one, whose loved one is no longer with this earth. Be strong. How many of you have heard, be strong? What does that mean, be strong? Like, does that mean that to be weak is not to feel and not to experience? What does be strong mean, right? It's not helpful, and it's a myth, right? It's a myth to say, well, you know, you need to be strong. Why? I think it takes great strength to 
acknowledge where you are, to feel what you are, called, feel the feels, right? To be in that space and be where you are. Another one is to keep busy. Keep, you need to keep busy. Go keep busy, go do something. Well, keeping busy is all well and good as long as you know what you're keeping busy from, right? If you're keeping busy because you don't want to feel the pain or the sadness of your diagnosis or the caregiver, your loved one's diagnosis and the caregiving process. If you know why you're doing it, that's one thing. But if you're doing it so that you can not feel at all, here's what's going to happen. It's going to come back and it's going to rear itself back up. Right? That's a form of stuffing. So keep busy is not a great myth. And those are things you're going to hear from people. Be strong. Well, you just need to keep busy. Sometimes people will tell you to just, you know, maybe you just need time alone. Grieve alone. That's a big, that's another one. Grieve alone. You need to be alone. Well, maybe you do. Maybe you do want to be alone a little bit, and that's okay. But maybe you want to be around people, because maybe that is helpful. So the grieve alone piece can sometimes be a double whammy, because somebody is saying, grieve alone, well, what is that telling you? They don't want to be with me. They're not comfortable with me. And now here I am, alone, sitting in this space where what I really need is support and love and comfort and guidance, right? No one's gonna heal you, no one's gonna cure this, but bearing witness and being present, we are social creatures, can be very soothing, right? We're meant to be with people. Being alone is not a terrible thing. When my husband, my first husband died, there were times I just wanted to be alone, but I also wanted the option of being with other people. So it's having that option, it's not about people not wanting to be with you. If you choose to be alone, be alone. But also welcome in some of that support that provides itself to you. Um, there are other myths, and I want you to think about some of them. Some things that people have said, some things that you believe about grief. The things that you have believed to be true that maybe as you think back aren't. Like replace the loss. Like if you've lost somebody you love, or your relationship. You know, and, and some of your relationships may have changed. You know, when you're diagnosed with an illness and you're the caregiver to a loved one with an illness, you know, relationships shift. Friendships can shift. And so sometimes the people that were part of our lives, they kind of disappear, not because they don't care, maybe because they just can't, they just can't handle it. So those relationships change. Who they are are not what you need in this time. And so replacing that is not possible because you can't replace somebody. You may find other people and find a different circle that works for you, but replacing a loss, replacing those friendships, is, it's just not an accurate description. You know, and it's another myth. It's not gonna make you feel better to find somebody else. It's going to maybe serve you in a different way, but we certainly miss our friends who have abandoned us, right? Or just drifted off from our lives. So just take a moment and digest that and think for a moment and you can do some writing on your own if you'd like about some of those myths. What are things that you told yourself to be true? Or what did other people tell you? What are some of the things that people were saying to you and have said to you and do say to you? Just think about that for just a moment. So there are stages, well, let me see. You may have heard about the stages of grief. Dabda. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Those were created by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. But here's the deal. They actually weren't created for grievers. They were created for patients, the newly diagnosed, um, and some of you are the patient. And some of those don't even apply to the diagnosed. Because here's the thing about grief. It's just not linear. It doesn't just go like, okay, we go through these stages and here we are. And okay, now I'm in acceptance, yay. It doesn't quite work that way. Some people aren't at all. You know, you get a diagnosis and you may be in disbelief. You know, your caregiver may be in disbelief. Or maybe not. Maybe like, you know what? I knew something was up. I knew something didn't feel right. You may not be in denial. Maybe you're really angry. Maybe you are ticked off. You're like, why? <laughs> Come on, really? Maybe, but maybe you're not. Maybe you're not angry. Um, and maybe you do want to bargain. Maybe like, okay, if you just heal me from this, I will do this. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't experience any depression whatsoever. Um, and the word depression for me kind of sticks a little bit uncomfortably. 
because unless it's a clinical medical depression, sometimes you're just grieving and sometimes you're just really upset, really bummed out, disappointed and just processing and absorbing all that has been going on, right? So not everybody's gonna get depressed and acceptance, right? Those are the, the, the uh, five stages of grief that I don't adhere to. Um, especially, like I said, they were not created for the griever. It was really for the newly diagnosed. So you can just cross that right off your list. No stages of grief. You know, it, grief can be, you know, like this. You can have this like big circle. Imagine like a big circle and in the circle could be your grief and it's big and then it shrinks sometimes and it expands and it shrinks and expands and you have these grief bursts and they happen and that's not unusual. And some of your grief bursts can come if you have a lupus flare up. Right? You could be skipping along, you're saying, you know, I'm feeling really well, medication is working, whatever you're doing is working, and, you know, just feeling really well, and your caregiver's like, oh, I'm feeling really well, this is great, this is great, you're having a great week, having a great month, having a great six months, whatever it is. And then you get a flare-up, and then it's like, oh, man, really? <laughs> like, come on, really? So that's a grief burst. You may have a grief trigger, and that's normal, and that's okay to let yourself feel that feel, you know, feeling the feels, holding space for yourself, nurturing yourself through that, and recognizing, recognizing that you're feeling that loop feeling, you know, that's part of mindfulness, um, the RAIN approach, and the RAIN means recognize, acknowledge, investigate, and nurture. So if you're feeling kind of, technical term, icky, <laughs> if you're just not feeling joyful, right? And you have this flare up and you're really upset and you're grieving. Recognize it. Just recognize that you're feeling it. Acknowledge it. You can investigate how you're feeling, where are you feeling it? You know, not just the flare up itself, but the feelings that you're experiencing. You know, is it here in your stomach? Is it in your heart space? You know, what does it feel like to you? Without labeling it. You know, you don't need to label it and say, oh, I'm just depressed. I'm this and that. You just are. And then just nurture yourself through it. Nurture yourself through that grief and let yourself be there. It's really okay. Sometimes when we're grieving, we try to stuff our feelings. Again, whether you're a patient, a caregiver, or experienced, you know, a loss, a, a loss other than lupus. And we stuff and we stuff and we stuff because we don't really want to feel, right? It's like uncomfortable. It's like, it just doesn't feel good. And because of all the things we've learned in society, Right? Don't feel bad. That's another one of the myths, right? How many times have you heard of that? And, oh, don't feel bad. So that not feeling bad. We stuff and we stuff and we stuff and we stuff and we stuff. And it's almost like if you have, if you put a tea kettle on your stove, right? And you fill it with water. But if the hole where the, you know, where the steam comes out is blocked up, what's going to happen, right? It's blocked up and the steam is building, the steam is building, the water's boiling, the water's boiling. Imagine, I want you just to close your eyes and imagine all this water boiling in the room so you are. Just imagine it's boiling, 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 but it has no way to get out because it's plugged up, right? That hole is plugged up, so what's gonna happen? Right, it's gonna just explode and that's what happens when we stuff our feelings and we don't allow ourselves to feel and experience where we are. So we really wanna be careful and mindful of that and pay attention to what we're feeling and let ourselves, give yourselves permission and be gentle with yourselves to feel all of those emotions, all of those experiences, the disappointment, whether you're angry, whatever it is, whatever your emotions are, because whatever you're feeling is individual to you, right? Every patient is an individual, every caregiver is an individual. So what you may be experiencing may not be the same as another lupus patient or the same as another lupus caregiver, and that's okay because we're all on this journey you know, taking our own path. There may be some similarities, but some differences. And that's really okay. So something else that people tend to do when they're grieving is something called STIRBS. S-T-E-R-B-S. -E S is just the plural for STIRBS. Short-term energy relieving behaviors. Short-term energy relieving behaviors. Now some of you be like, I think I get it. Here's what I'm going to tell you what it's about. Short-term energy relieving behavior disturbs are when we do activities or do things so we don't have to feel anything, right? We find ways to make ourselves feel better, right? They're short-term energy relieving. We, you know, we want to lift our energy. We want to lift our spirits. 
So it could be retail therapy. Well, that's fine. I mean, that's all well and good. Understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it and not going to an extreme to a point where you are not allowing yourself to, again, and I say this a lot, feel the feels. Be in that space. Be in the grief space. Be in the pain. Be in the disappointment and the sadness. It's okay. You know, other things that people may do when they're doing short-term energy relieving behaviors is over-exercising. So I'm sure, you know, exercising is good. It's healthy, right? It's important. We want to stay healthy, especially if we're diagnosed with something. We want to move our bodies, you know, and get the blood flowing. And, you know, we have these, this connective tissue, as you all know, in our bodies, and we need to release whatever we're holding in those places. Understand, again, why you're doing that. Right? Understand what the things you're doing are, the short-term energy relieving behaviors, alcohol. Uh, think of other things. Think of some things that you may do, because we all do them. You know, when Stephen died, my late husband died, I definitely did the retail therapy. I was shopping up a storm. Um, and it was okay, because I knew why I was doing it. And, you know, it tapered off. It tapered off. So just really be mindful. So think about for a moment what your short-term energy relieving behaviors are. Just think about it for a second. You can even write them down if you want. I'm going to give you a moment just to, to process all we've been talking about for the past 20 minutes and think about some of your own starts, some of the things that you may do that, may, that you are stuffing. And I'm just going to give you a moment. So, another thing that I want to talk about with you is guilt. And whether you're a patient or a caregiver or a friend, there's a lot of the times that you'll hear people say, and you myself may say it, I feel guilty. Right? There may be lupus patients who are not experiencing as much difficulty as another lupus patient. There may be a caregiver whose loved one is not experiencing as much difficulty as another lupus patient and their caregiver. So here's the thing about the word guilt. If you look it up in the dictionary, the definition of the word guilt is the intent to harm or hurt another. It's also going against your moral compass, obviously committing a crime or feeling guilty of committing a crime. So ask yourself, Am I going up against my moral compass or pushing the thing? No. Is my intent to harm or hurt another person, the other person? No. And you haven't committed a crime. You know, sometimes you say you feel guilty because maybe you're not as nice to your caregiver because you're not hungry, you're in pain, you know, and you're having a flare up and you're impatient and all those things. And your caregiver gets impatient, right? The caregiver, sometimes you get impatient. That's okay. Welcome to humanness. So, Let's take the word guilt out of the vocabulary. It's not useful, right? It just adds one more burden. It adds one more thing to make us feel bad. So let's take it, put it back in the dictionary, Wikipedia, whatever, wherever, free dictionary, wherever you look up words nowadays, especially the internet. Let's get rid of that. Let's, let's remove the word guilt from our vocabulary. So then what are you feeling? Why don't you take a moment to think about what you're feeling? in those moments where you're using the word guilt and I want you to, and I'm gonna help you find that word in a moment, but I want you to think for a moment, what's a better description of what you're feeling besides guilt? So just think for a moment. Okay, so I'm gonna digress for a minute. I was having a conversation with one of my kids, I have four kids and the oldest, we were having a conversation about something. And he said, and I feel so guilty about the situation. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, here's the definition of guilt. And I shared exactly what I shared with you. Intent to harm or hurt another. And he said, of course not. You go against your moral compass, of course not. Have you committed a crime? Of course not. And I said to him, so what, find a different word, Put it, get rid of the word. What's a different word? What's another way for you to describe how you're feeling. And he looked at me and he said, I feel really bad about it. I feel bad about it. So think about that. 
Is that more descriptive of where you are? Do you feel that way? Do you feel regretful? Do you wish it could be different? That's what many of us feel. And we use the word guilt by mistake because we don't know better. That's some of the words that we've been indoctrinated with. So we remove that. Perhaps you feel badly. Maybe you feel badly that your friend and maybe you're in a lupus support group or whatever, your friend or you're a caregiver and your friend, you know, your caregiving friend's lupus loved one is having a flare up, but you're, you're not. You're not, you know, how come I get to be okay all these months and you're not doing well? Maybe you feel badly and that's normal and that's compassionate. That's compassion. It's okay. Guilt, mm -mm. you've done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. It's all good. It's compassion. Feel badly. That's okay. That's normal. You know, those grief bursts sometimes can happen too in those moments. And you think, oh, you know, what do I have to feel bad about? Look at this one. Because you just do and it's okay. It's really okay. You know, you may also find, and we talked, I mentioned in the beginning, how people will say things like, well, it could be worse. You know, you could have something else, or it could be worse. As always, it could be worse, right? Or you may see somebody and think, you know, they're better off than I am. What do they have to complain about? What are they grieving about? And here's what I want to tell you. We all grieve at 100%, no matter what the loss is. Whether it's the loss and receiving a diagnosis, the loss of death of a loved one, the loss of a job, the loss of a divorce, the loss of empty nesting, whatever that loss is. Here's the thing. We, our bodies, our minds, our hearts, cannot differentiate. So we all grieve at 100%, right? It's not a competition. We all grieve at 100%. So recognize that and embrace that and hold space for that. You know, I'm going to get ready to finish up soon, and I so appreciate you you're staying with me on this. Uh, what I want to say is that, yes, be gentle with yourself. Be kind to yourself. Grief is a normal and natural reaction to a loss. Grief is the conflicting feeling caused by the end or change in a familiar pattern of behavior. Give yourselves permission to feel the feels. You don't always have to be upbeat. You may have somebody come be with you. I had a client recently um, and somebody wanted to tell stories about her late husband and she said, I really don't want to do that. And they said, well, she, you know, she's working with me. And so what did Holly say to do? She said, Holly said to feel what I feel and to just be in that space. This is your journey. This is your journey as a caregiver, as a patient, a loved one, a friend. This is your journey. And only you can determine your journey and what works for you on your journey. So try not to get tripped up by other people's definitions of the journey and what they think the journey should look like, right? Everybody has their own stories. We have these tapes that play and tell us things, you know, and, and we got the ego thing going, the you know, it's telling you, oh, you should be grateful, you should be this, you should be that, you need to get out, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let it go, let it go. Ego, using goodness out, let it go. Drop into your heart space. Be in your heart space. Show yourself the love that you would show someone else that may be going through a difficult time. And if you're in a great place with your lupus and you're not experiencing flare-ups and you are not as having as much of a good thing to say as someone else you know, also give yourself permission to be joyful. It's okay. You're not taking from one for yourself. Right? You're not taking from anybody else. Where you are is where you are. I also want to share um, about meditation and just giving yourself, if you're able to just sort of let yourself be in your heart, just taking deep breaths in those moments so that when you're feeling grief and you're feeling sad and those triggers and bursts show up, that you just breathe into them. Be aware of them and breathe into them. And remember something. So grief ebbs and flows. 
Right? We know none of us are miserable 24 seven. We're not miserable forever. We have good days. We have not such good days. And sometimes we have really yucky bad days. But not every day is like that. And sometimes we need to cry and just let it out. And that's really good because it's very cleansing. It's actually been a study about grief and tears that the tears from grief have a different chemical component than regular tears. So it's good, it's very cleansing, and it's good to get them out. And you can't cry 24 hours a day, I promise you. So if you need to cry, let it out. Don't stop, but you need to release them. We need to give ourselves permission. This is the time. Let's be active grievers, right? And let's take the action that we need to move through our grief, right? So the best way to move through our grief is to experience it and feel it. Stuffing it's not gonna help. It's not gonna help. You know, we wanna use the tools. So some of the tools are feeling it, being in it, understanding that there are conflicting feelings, right? They can coexist. You can be in a place of joy and get great news and feel really good. And at the same time, feel kind of sad about your diagnosis, about your loved one, whatever that may be. They can coexist and that's okay. Right? That's all part of it. And education is key. So this workshop is a really important piece because if we don't know, we don't know, right? Until we know, we can't do what we need to do for ourselves. So if you have any questions, you know, I have limited time, and like I said, I wish we could dialogue with each other because it would be a really amazing um, discourse with one another and to interact and just sort of write things down and talk, talk, talk. So you are welcome to reach out to me. Jenny has my contact info. I will tell you that the, my email address is goldenheartgrief at gmail.com. If you have any questions, any concerns, anything you just want to share, I am available to you. I'm so grateful to be here. I want everybody to just take a sort of deep breath and release it. Um, I thank you again for letting me bear witness and be present with you on this day and am here with you and hold space for you and just surround you with so much love and light and thank you.